So I'm Brad. I'm going to be presenting the, the final presentation for the day. It's on best methodology for sector rotation analysis. Okay, so I'm with Upside Options. And this is one of the strategies that we have. Okay, the objective of this presentation is we're going to analyze big picture. Should we buying should we be, we be buying stocks right now? Then sector analysis, talk about where is the cash flowing. And we'll review our methodology of using fundamental, technical, and quantitative analysis. That's also known as quantum mental analysis. We'll look at some of our holdings of our sector rotation strategy. Those will be the primary objective of the presentation. Okay, I have three slides on who we are. And then I'll jump into everything else. Okay, so we have a big cap growth strategy. That looks at stocks greater than $10 billion in market cap. We have a small and mid-cap growth strategy. We buy stocks with strong momentum with a market cap of $250 million to $10 billion. We have a contrarian strategy. So we're buying stocks that have been out of favor for 6 to 12 months and starting to recover. We have a sector rotation strategy, and that's what we're going to talk about today. This concentrates on the strongest stocks within the strongest industry sectors. And that strategy is up 9.9% year to date. And we have an iron condor or pinnacle strategy. And that was a presentation that I gave earlier this morning. So it is on a recording, if you haven't seen it. And that's a conservative, non-directional, income-generating, all-weather strategy. It opens credit spreads and iron condors on the S&P 500 index. It typically generates 25 to 5% per month. It has similarities to selling covered calls, where it collects premium each month. And it's up 20.3% year-to-date. <laughs> okay, how do we select our stocks? Well, we have a four-level fundamental four-level quantum mental analysis system where it blends technical, fundamental, and factor-based quantitative analysis. We allocate 4 to 5% to each stock. The portfolio is hedged to reduce downside during corrections, and it's an options-based hedge using the SPY ETF. And I'll talk a little more about how we do that. So we follow strict exit rules. We're able to let most winners run. But the exit rules are fast enough to lock in gains and to protect capital. For example, in October 2018, we went from 75% allocated to 15% allocated in about six days. So we just follow our rules. And when the market starts uh, throwing us out of trades, we get exited out. Uh, many of our trades had gains, so we took whatever gains we could get. I couldn't tell you what was going to happen in October 2008. All I knew is that uh, some indicators were telling us that we could be rolling over. We went down to pretty low allocation levels, and, and then the market actually corrected pretty heavily by 25%, 20 to 25%. So we finished out 2018 with strong gains, plus 14 to plus 18% gains, and the benchmarks of the S&P 500 and the Russell 2000 index, they closed down 2018 with losses minus 8 to minus 12%. Okay, so how do we select our stocks? We have a four-level quantum, quantum mental analysis. We're blending technical, fundamental, factor-based analysis. We're allocating 4 to 5% to each stock. We hedge the portfolio. I'll talk more about that. And we have a, a, a little trick of how we can keep the cost of our hedges cheap. And then we follow strict exit rules. So we finished off the year strongly, 2018, and the benchmarks all closed in negative territory. OK, four-level quantum mental scanner. So the first thing we look at is big picture analysis. So big picture, looking at the look at the technicals of the indexes, uh, ETFs. We're looking at breadth, like like advanced decline line data. We're looking at big picture fundamentals, which is usually macro data, economic data, sector strength, sentiment, and we'll talk a lot more about sector strength since that is the topic of this presentation. We're talking about the sector rotation analysis strategy, um, and then overall that modulates our bullish and bearish exposure levels. And then we do a technical scan. We're looking for high probability setups. And this one's pretty straightforward because we're doing breakouts. These are pure breakouts. Then we do a fundamental scan on the, on the particular stocks we're looking at. We want to make sure they're strong companies. Then we do a quantitative screen, and that's a probabilistic linear regression analysis type of tool. And I'll show you the output of what that looks like and how we use it. And then technicals to trigger the entries and the exits. Okay, so we're talking about sector rotation methodology, and this is for our sector rotation strategy. So main thing we care about, one thing we care about, and we put a lot of weight on, is sector strength. 
So one tool you can use is stockcharts.com, and it's a relative performance tool. And I'll show a, a chart of that. And then sector relative uh, strength tools, and I'll show you one that I use. And you can use a quant model to rank sector strength along with other variables. So sometimes we'll, we got a model that we use. <clears throat> okay, so after sector strength is which one of the first things I look at, I wanna make sure that I'm in the top sectors, top five sectors, top 10 sectors. And then we look at the technicals. We wanna decide on what technical setup we desire. And in this particular model, this, this strategy, we're using breakouts, pure breakouts. And then fundamentals, I use a tool called MarketSmith. That's part of uh, IBD, Investors Business Daily. It's a good tool. It's a little pricey, but it's a good tool. And there's other, you know, fundamental tools out there that you can look at. And you know, the basics are earnings growth, revenue growth, return on equity, relative strength. That that's kind of more technical. But um, I I look at probably a dozen indicators within MarketSmith. It's taken me a couple years to really get comfortable with it and to figure out how to mix and match the screeners um, when it comes to looking at fundamental strength. If you had to look at just one thing, make sure you're looking at earnings growth. Is the company generating positive earnings? And if you can find one that's actually in earnings acceleration growth, where growth is accelerating, even better. So that's kind of the main thing to watch. And then statistical quant. Um, I'll show you what we do with regression-based quantitative analysis, or at least what, what the output looks like and some of the things that we do with it. Oh, well, here it is right here. So here's, here's what a typical quant output looks like. And it's called factor-based quantitative analysis. Another word for it is econometrics. It's basically using multiple linear regression models. It provides probabilities of a stock following through on a breakout or a breakdown. For this, for the bullish trades, we're doing breakouts. This list right here is 4,000 stocks long. We um, use final screening, and the universe is about 4,000 stocks. So the tool runs, gives us lots of probabilities, and it gives me a final validation if I really want to get into a stock or not. So it gives us an edge. It, it does provide an edge. It does provide a higher probability of being right if you're getting in and of, of a stock going through. So that's all I'm going to cover on quant. Um, this usually takes about two, two and a half years of experience. Usually you take a class on this, and then it takes a lot of practice of modeling and then knowing how to refine the models because it's all statistics, statistical analysis and linear regression analysis. So if you want to learn more about this, just go into Google and type in econometrics or you know, factor-based quantitative analysis, and you'll see a lot of papers come up. And um, it's a very interesting, very interesting stuff. Okay, I'm ready to get into um, some charts. Let's first look at the snapshot of today's market. As of August 10th, we have a slightly expensive stock market trading at 17.2 times forward earnings. Right now I'm using $173 for earnings for the S&P 500. Could be a little rich. I see some uh, investment houses are already lowering down to $165 worth of earnings. If that's, we use that number, we'd be at 17.5 to 17.8 times earnings. It's getting a little rich. U.S. economy has been slowing, and global economies have been slowing at a faster rate. Corporate earnings have slowed. Flat growth for Q1, got flat growth coming in for Q2, and now I'm seeing estimates of flat growth for Q3. However, corporate earnings were really strong last year, like plus 20% every single quarter. So that's not sustainable. And having two, three quarters, four quarters of flat growth is really not a, not a huge deal and the market's not too worried about it. Headwind that will keep the SPX below its all-time high of 3026. Newest stars from China, that's not good. Continuous political uncertainty, that can sell off stocks at any time, not good. Negative surprises on economic data. This is something I watch, Citibank Economic Surprise Index. You can type that into uh, Google and you'll see it come up. And it basically has been saying that economic data has been surprising to the negative for the last year. Just shows a gradual decline in economic growth for the US. A yield curve that's flattish and was inverted, and recently it went flat again. Um, so the bond market, which is the smart money, is still projecting a slowing US economy in 2019 for that. 
tailwind, tailwind that puts a floor into the market. So we have a dovish Fed, lowering interest rates when needed. Recent jobs report was good, but still a tight jobs market at full employment. Low interest rates and low inflation, so that's good for stocks. Consumer is still strong in spending, that's 70% of the economy, so that's good. Most analysts, economists are projecting plus 1.7% GDP growth or greater for 2019. Going into a recession is a gradual process. It's not an event. It takes many, many quarters to unfold. When they finally hit, usually you have to almost kind of look backward and say, oh, we're in a recession. Usually you don't even know you're in it. Um, and recessions usually cut the stock market by minus 30 to minus 50%. And this market's been volatile. Um, it's been difficult to generate consistent positive gains using stocks, ETFs, and, and indexes. So let's look at a few charts for big picture. So the S&P 500 um, broke out, failed most recent uh, tariffs on China. Now we'll see if we can get back over 2947. So 2947 is the breakout there. 28.72 is, this represents the January 2018 high. 28.15 is another level that represents some resistance. And then here's the 200-day moving average right here. Right now we're stuck in this range and we'll see if, see if we can get over 29.47. And we might. Um, now we had the market, I usually do my trading in the last hour of the day. And we had a sell-off. I mean, well, the market started selling in the last 30 minutes of the day and tells me that eh, we, we could have a down down day on Monday. And if we do, then we're probably going to come back down and test 2872 or even possibly retest 2815. The Qs kind of looks the same. Right now it's under the 50. It's hitting resistance under the 50 and under this resistance level here. This is the you know 100 of the largest, mostly technology stocks. So once you start breaking over the 50-day line, just like for the, for the SPX, once we get over the 50-day line, then you know more cash will flow into the market. So we just had a correction. We just had a 6% pullback. It's going to take eh, maybe another week to stabilize and and or at least figure out where it wants to go. Small caps dissipating. This is not good, and we really will not have an all clear signal for the market until this gets over 160. So this is the IWM. It tracks the Russell 2000 small cap index. And the 200-day moving average is still downward sloping. So that doesn't look good. All right, and then the chart of the day or the week of the month is the uh, yield on the 10-year Treasury. Look at this. This is crazy. So money has been pouring into Treasuries, pushing down the interest rate on the 10-year to 17.34. went as low as, look at a touch, like intraday, 16, 1.6%. This is the smart money, and it's saying that the economy is prepared to slow, and they believe the economy is going to slow. Okay, let's look at sector strength. And now, um, for big picture analysis, this also just gives me a snapshot of you know how healthy this economy is, you know how healthy is the market, investor sentiment, is cash flowing into stocks, or is it, or are they not? Um, this tool is is an automated tool for giving you sector strength. And what I'm looking at are ETFs representing a lot of sectors. I got 75 ETFs that I track. And for example, gold's on the top, GLD. Now this, this is an ETF, but it just tracks one thing, gold, where most of these ETFs have lots of stocks in them, like VNQ. It has lots of REITs in them, in it. And it's basically blending and modeling, it uses a return A, return B, a volatility rank, and here's here's how it's modeling it. It's like return A represents how much TF has moved in the last two months, and I have a 25% weighting on that. Return B is how much this ETF has moved in the last 20 days, and I have a 50% weighting on that. And then this column is volatility, change in volatility over the last 20 days, and I have a 25% weighting on that. And then it gives me a rank. So I'm showing the top 25 out of 75 ETFs. And the first thing that jumps out at to me is all the defensives um, are on the top. Gold, real estate, platinum, REITs, silver, all on the top. So that's pretty defensive. That's very defensive. Um, so that's, that's what really jumps out at me. 
Okay. Now, in general, for sector rotation analysis, we want to, we want to be kind of focusing in on this top 20 list, top top 25 maybe. And so this is one way of getting uh, getting visibility into sector strength. Okay. Another tool I use is this one's in StockCharts.com. It's called a relative performance chart, and I just show these ETFs right across here consumer discretionary, communication, technology, industrials, materials, energy, consumer staples, healthcare, utilities, financials, and real estate. And then here they, they're shown here all the way across. They're color-coded. They all, they're all zeroed out. This is a 22-day chart, so it's all zeroed out here. And then S&P 500 is clicked, and what that does is it normalizes everything to how it moves in relative in a relative way to the S&P 500 so it's relative performance to the S&P 500 so if you see for example this green line here and it's climbing and this re represents real estate you can see that once it crossed up through the zero line and it went into positive territory it's outperforming the S&P 500 and then this one energy has been underperforming the S&P 500, and it's still underperforming and underperforming even more. So this is called a relative performance chart, sector strength, and I have a you know, good 10 of these with all the different ETFs in it, and it just gives you a nice visual understanding of where the money is flowing. Anything that's been kind of moving into the positive territory, so this is staples, utilities, purple staples, um, you know, industrials have been rolling over a little bit. All these are neutral. Technology has been neutral. So we can see where the money is flowing. Okay, so big picture conclusion. Should we be buying stocks right now as of August 10th? Well, the answer is yes. But it's not healthy that gold, utilities, consumer staples, REITs, and treasuries are leading the way. That's very defensive. Yield curve is flat. So the bond market, the smart money, thinks the economy is going to slow. Corporate earnings growth has slowed, or has, has stalled, basically. Small caps are not participating. So it's best to follow strict exit rules and best to keep hedges active. Um, on the positive, interest rates and inflation are low. So this is good for businesses and stocks. Jobs market is strong and still expanding. The consumer is strong, continues to spend. So 70% of the U.S. economy is consumer spending. So that's a positive. And the Fed is accommodative, willing to lower interest rates to keep the economy growing. Okay, so what I did is I just did this analysis right here. That was step one. Macro analysis, big picture. Should we be in stocks? How much should be bullish? How much should be, should be bearish? Should we have the hedges in place? And my conclusion is, is yeah, yeah, we need to start opening he uh, hedges and keeping the hedges running continuously. And, um, but there's some things breaking out. There's always stocks breaking out and we can, we can run, we can make some money in the market. Okay, so next would be a technical scan looking for a high probability set. We basically use breakouts for the strategy. Then we do the fundamentals screen, quantitative screen, and then we use technicals to, 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 to trigger entry and exits. Okay, so let's just jump in and look at some stocks. Um, so these are all in um, our sector rotation strategy. This one's up about 10% year to date. The real number, it's a real portfolio. We're putting four to five percent behind each trade. Includes all winners, all losers. Anything that's a loser, we're trying to keep our losses under 4%, 3%, 5% in that range. If something just get, gets hammered, because, you know, we do hold most things through earnings. That's a very difficult decision to make. And recently I've just like, you know, hey, these are fast growing companies. These are good companies. Um, you know, some are a little expensive, but I don't want them to be too expensive. If something's trading at 150 times earnings, I'm probably going to get out of that before earnings because it, it is priced for perfection. They have to say all the right stuff. If they guide down on anything, that stock's going to get hammered. Um, Square, that's a perfect example. That one got hammered, trades at 150 50 times earnings. And so, you know, but a lot of these are going to still be kind of expensive because these are fast-growing companies, 
excellent companies. Top line revenue growth is strong, return on equity is strong, uh, earnings growth is usually in the plus 15% range each quarter. And so the PE sometimes are going to be in the 30s, sometimes 40. Um, okay, so ICLR, ICON. And this is in diagnostics and research. That whole space has just been on fire. So medical diagnostic and research and equipment and tools for you know medical stuff. Um, so here's a typical stock. The first thing I'm looking at, this is weekly down here. And I have a 17 and a 43 EMA that I'm watching. So if you, walk, if you walk away from any nugget today, walk away from this one, 1743. Make sure you use it. It's a weekly chart, 17-week EMA, 43-week EMA. If the 17 is above the 43, stay long. It's telling you the, the stock or the ETF or the index is in a long-term confirmed uptrend. If the 17 starts getting choppy and starts crossing down below, be careful. If it really starts crossing but down below and it's really kind of validated, then that stock is no longer in a long-term confirmed uptrend. It's in a long-term confirmed downtrend. So it's a slow moving indicator. Um, you don't want to be using it really for entries and exits because it's way too slow moving. But it's what it's just it's basically telling you, you know, should you be in that stock in general? Okay, so this is the weekly chart. So each candlestick represents one week of trade, 1743 EMA. You can see that's a 17 above the 43. We have a nice cup. This is a cup. I like this. All right? I want it to be long, like many, many, many months. And it is. It finally broke up through. You'll get a lot of choppiness when it's breaking up through. Um, you just want to make sure it stays over breakout. Okay, so there's one stock that we are, we're in for this strategy. Here's ICE, Intercontinental Exchange. This one actually consolidated a long time. See this right here? This is nice. The longer it consolidates, the better. So here it is on the daily chart, long consolidation. I drew my breakout line at $78. You get in around here and you stay in. Stay in until it throws you out. And um, you know if it starts taking out a lower low, get out. If you get a plus 10, plus 15 percent gain, take half. Um, this market can move at any time, and we can have a tweet that just trashes the market again. Um, so, um, if, if in general, I'll, I'll show you my just in general exit and entry rules. But if it's staying over the 50-day line, it's usually good to stay in because it's still in a confirmed uptrend. Okay, gold. GLD. Um, I don't have this one in the portfolio, but I have recommended it um, through other channels. It went sideways and did nothing for literally seven years. So we got a breakout line drawn. Breakouts at 128. So here's the daily chart up here, 128. And once you get a breakout, and if once you believe and feel comfortable, it's going to stay above the breakout, get in, and then stay in until it starts breaking below the 50-day line. That's, that's, that's one exit rule that you could use. Genpak. This one pulled back. I want it to get back over this breakout line here. That's about right in this range here. So you get in around 36. It's sitting at 41. Looks good. Tyson Foods. This one had a deep, this was a correction kind of, uh, that's not true. So yeah, just basically it's pulled back for whatever reason. Um, I think this one had to do with, you know, all this, all the meat, beyond meat and stuff like that. And um, Tyson Foods does have a competing product. <clears throat> and we just want a new breakout. So we just got a fresh breakout on this. You don't really know how high it's going to go. You just don't. Um, some of these have kept us in, and it'll climb 50% over three, four, five, six months. And others will just shake you out. You know, you get a 5% return if you're lucky, 7% um, return, and then um, it shakes you out. But if you're not in, you just don't know. There's a few that I didn't get in, and they were, they're, they're up literally 80% over the last four months. And you're like, darn, well, I missed that. Here's a HAE, Haymonics. 
medical instruments and supplies again. The space has been very strong. We got in around here. Now, it did retest once, but you don't want that to throw you out because you want to just make sure it stays over breakout. What I like about this is it has a nice deep pullback and cup, which is this piece here. What I don't like about this is how much it got, how much it's gone up since 2017. It's already, it's literally tripled in value. I don't like that, and that's uh, I am a little concerned about that. But when you look at the PE ratio on this stock, it's not horribly overpriced. So, um, and by the way, I'm looking at the fundamentals on all of these. You know, so I bring up my market Smith and I analyze the fundamentals, and I got about a dozen things I look at, and it tells makes me feel comfortable that this is a this is a rock solid company that's growing fast. Moody's, same thing, pull back, break up through, nice cup in. Now, this is pretty typical. It's going to climb, and then it pulls back and tests. You just cross your fingers that you don't get thrown out. You don't want it to go much lower than the breakout that you've drawn. If it starts breaking below your breakout, it looks like it's going to close below the breakout, especially the following day it's going to close below the breakout. That's a fail. Get out. Sometimes it throws you out. Now, if, you, if it throws you out, I don't want to get back in until it breaks above this right here. I want it to take out a higher high. All right, so here's an example of a stock you don't want to chase, like Visa. So if you didn't get in down here, you know, it, it's sometimes you just missed it. You missed it, move on. Like MasterCard and Visa, they look very similar. And... What I'm showing here is like the 13 is another thing you can watch. It's like the 13 EMA and the 50 EMA. Once the 13 EMA starts getting tighter and tighter and it looks like it's going to cross below, you want to be out. So that's another possible exit rule that you can use is a 13, 50 EMA cross. And you're never going to time the top. So um, it's best to, you know, you can select a moving average and, you know, two moving averages and wait for a cross. So this is an example of a 13 and a 50. Um, you can also use a 10 a 10 and um, a, a 40, you know, that's that's a possibility. So you just kind of play around with a couple moving averages to where, and use something that you feel comfortable with. But the only way to get into these stocks is once it climbs, pulls back, tests the 50, for example, and then you wait for it to take out a new high. So that would have been right there, and you could have, and you could have gotten back in. That's an, that's an opportunity to get in, but, you know, it's already overextended. It's already gone up, you know, 10%, 15%, whatever. And so now it has a lot, it has a further to fall, let's put it that way, because my exit is way down here. Um, now, you could put a trailing stop loss, and that's probably the best thing to do. If it keeps on climbing, then what you do is maybe you just stop it out if it crosses through the 50 or a 55-day EMA. You just don't want to take any huge loss because, um, you know, that's a long way to fall. So if you get in down here right at the fresh breakout, less to fall. Okay, entry rules. So best to enter a position during a fresh breakout, closer to the breakout level. It's not wise to chase stocks that have already been running for a long time. For example, if they're already up 5%, you know, we missed it, just move on. But as an option, if it's already up greater than 5%, and, and if you still want to get into that stock, just wait for it to pull back and then re-enter the stock when it takes out a higher high. And, and sometimes that works. Sometimes you can, you know, it'll run in waves in two or three waves. Stocks usually ebb and flow in a wave-like action. There are always fresh breakouts happening, so focus on those. And then for the exit rules, if a stock starts to break below its breakout level, exit the position. It's failed. And you just want to make sure, you know, in the last 20 minutes of the day, if it looks like it's going to close below breakout, then get out. If the stock stays above its 50-day EMA, it's best to hold the stock and let it run. As the stock trends upward, if the stock starts to break below the 50-day EMA, you could exit the position. Or like I mentioned, if you want to use a moving average, you know, maybe you select like a 10.50. So if the 10-day EMA is crossing through the 50, maybe that's your exit signal. So it gives you a little more room to allow the stock to, to, to breathe. 
if you're exited out of a position but want to get back in, wait for the stock to take out a higher high. So let it let it roll over a little bit, let it climb back up, and then once it starts taking out a higher high, you can get in. So that's that's one entry. That's a potential entry rule. It's it's a safer rule. Let's put it that way. I mean, some people who like Elliott Wave analysis, they'd say, no, no, no. Oh, I mean, that's Elliott Wave, and I want to get in down when it's lower. Yes, well, that's an option. But I, I would make sure that you put it into an Elliott Wave package and make sure that it does see that pattern. That's what I would do. Okay, active hedging. Um, so right now we don't have any hedges, um, and I was planning on putting on a hedge in the next month. I mean, unfortunately, I missed it with, you know, uh, with Trump. You can't predict tweets. You can't predict what he's going to say around China tariffs. Um, but overall, with what I see, we're going to turn on the first active hedge in the next month, and it takes 8% of the cash. So for a ten thousand for a hundred thousand dollar portfolio, it's basically it's a three thousand dollar position, and then we spend, oh, and then we use five uh, k of it um, to write credit spreads to pay for the hedge. So it's a unique approach. So about eight percent of the portfolio is allocated to the hedge. It helps reduce drawdown when the market corrects greater than minus three point five percent, and it can generate a nice chunk of cash. Just one hedge using eight um, percent, it could generate. You know, for like a hundred thousand dollar portfolio, we can get three thousand, four thousand, five thousand dollars can be generated um, from the hedge. And then if I put on two hedges, then multiply that by two. So now we're using sixteen percent of the cash, and I can generate at least six thousand dollars in cash, maybe up to ten, twelve thousand in cash on, on a pullback. So what I do is I pay for the hedges using I sell far out of the money call options because um, that's one thing that I've been doing forever feel very comfortable with it, and I can keep these hedges running continuously without negatively impacting the returns on the portfolio, because um, hedges are expensive. Hedges are insurance, and if you don't try to pay for them in a, in a particular way, sooner or later, you just don't do them, and that's why if you line up 100 money managers, most don't hedge. Um, one, they don't probably feel comfortable in trying to pay for it in some way like I do. Two, it's a lot of work. Um, I'm opening up 90-day hedges, and I got to roll them every 30 days. I got to manage them, and if the market's in an uptrend, I got to keep on rolling them up. I have to keep on paying for those hedges because they're losing value. So I'm trying to just break even. I'm trying to keep the hedges free, and if I can keep them free, then I can leave them on all the time because we just don't know what's going to hit next. And at any time, we can be down 5%, 7%, and then sooner or later, we're going to be down 10 to 15%. Um, but we'll see. We'll just take it week by week and month by month. Okay, summary of differentiators. So we main, uh, maintain continuous options-based hedges in the portfolio. We pay for those hedges by writing far, far out of the money, extremely high probability call spreads. Those are all like five deltas because I'm not bringing in much. I don't need to bring in that much. Um, compared to other strategies where I'm truly doing credit spreads and iron condors, those deltas are more like 15, um, where I'm bringing in much chunkier, you know, um, credits. But for this, I, I can I can write stuff that's very far out of the money, and they're all they're open for two weeks. Collect the premium, open it up again for another two weeks. I can I can pay for the the, the hedges, um, but that takes a lot of work. That takes a lot of effort. Uh, we follow strict exit rules. That's another differentiator. Um, line up a bunch of money managers, and most don't, and they will let things draw down. I don't play that. I don't play those that game. Um, we can usually keep our losing trades under 5%, and I'm a true believer of this, of this right here. A stock can be a Wall Street darling until it's not. A stock can be a Wall Street darling until it's not. So... If anything starts breaking below certain support levels, certain major support levels and moving averages, whatever you're watching, um, get out because it could start going lower and you just don't know how low it's going to go. All right, quantum mental analysis, that's a blend of technical, fundamental, and quantitative analysis. That is one of our differentiators. So that kind of summarizes our differentiators. Um, if you want to learn more about the hedges, you can you can contact us at support at upsideoptions.net or if you really have any questions. Okay, so um, we have free trials available and you know consider letting us do the hard work for you. This takes easily three hours a day for for the portfolio manager um, uh, to you know as we're watching our our 
docs, you know, sometimes four hours a day easily um, for maintaining our portfolios, finding stocks, replenishing stocks, um, closing stocks that we don't like. So there's quite a few, every day we have something that we're buying or selling in, in our four, port, four directional portfolios. That's small and mid cap, that's large cap, that's sector rotation and contrarian, those four portfolios. So consider trying one of our services for free where we do the laborious work for you in finding these fast growing companies that are ready to buy. Just receive a continuous stream of high quality stock picks and consider auto trading. So you can auto trade this where we do everything for you. So you just uh, turn on an auto trade rule in your brokerage account and then you don't have to worry about it. And uh, um, again, we follow strict exit rules. Capital preservation is a very, very high priority. So we keep those losses pretty tight. Um, and then the hedges definitely help um, because those those usually those usually turn into 100% winners, sometimes 200% winners, depending on the pullback and the duration. So that generates a nice chunk of cash that goes into into the account, even even with just a single hedge that's using 8% of the capital. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. And um, if you want to see our weekly market analysis. Um, Go to upside options. Actually, let me just bring that up really fast. That's what it looks like here. So it's on the website. It's on uh, upsideoptions.net. You'll see weekly market analysis. It's very robust. So if you don't have time, but you still have the interest and you're still trading, I would read at least the first section, just the first five paragraphs. That's it. And then for all the analysis, you don't have to read all this, but there's 50 charts in here. A lot of charts. So I'm looking at, and, and all the ETFs and sectors, they're down here. And so when I'm doing sector analysis, I want to make sure I understand what the chart looks like also. So for example, XLP, consumer staples. I mean, I want to know what that chart looks like. Even though the tool tells me they're number one or in the top five, I want to make sure I understand what the chart looks like. And yes, that's very strong. And uh, XLV, healthcare, I want to, I, I need to see the chart. And I need to see where their support levels are and what it's doing. Okay, so that is um, that is it. So thank you very much, and that is the end of our summit. Uh, let me let me actually look at if we have any questions before I let you guys go. Doing more stock trades or options, John ask that. Um, okay, so for this particular strategy, we are not buying options on the stocks. Um, the, the reason, let's put it this way, you buy options on a stock and all of a sudden we have another 9-11. You're going to lose all your money if you have options on that stock. You will lose all your money. So um, The what I made a decision on, and, and, and also when it comes to institutionals, institutional accounts, they won't play with options. They won't will not buy options on stocks. They want they want to own the stock because you have another disaster. At least you own the stock, and it, it might draw down 50%. You go into a recession, but go you know go back to 9/11. What happened after that? Everything got cut in half, and it took a year, year and a half for things to recover. Um, look at 2008. So, um, but now 2008 was a little different. But 9/11 was like you know a shock to the system. And um, so, if you own an option on it, and if something really goes wrong, and that stock draws down, you know, falls 15%, 20%, stays down there for a year, or it stays down there even for just a month or two, you're going to lose most of your money with those options. Now, um, I had a trader that worked for me, and he did options. You know, and he had to leave for certain reasons. Uh, his strategy was doing okay, um, and he was buying calls and buying puts. We're doing directionals on stocks, and you can do that. You can do that. Now, just remember, there's really no free lunch. So now, if your your losses are going to be closer to 40 to 50 percent when you're buying um, options on stocks, so that's where your cutoff is. So that's your stop loss, 40 to 50 percent. Can't go any higher than that, and that's going to be typical. You'll see a lot of 35 to 50 percent losses on your losers. Winners, you gotta, you need the doubles. You need 100% returns on a lot of your winners um, to make it work, and you can do that. But you have time decay, a lot of time decay, and you have to watch them very closely. And sometimes it's tough to get in and out of these stocks too. You know, when you're buying options on stocks. 
Okay, uh, let's see. EMAs or SMAs, um, that's from Arnold. So uh, EMAs, I look at EMAs for all the faster moving moving averages, 13-day EMA, 50-day EMA. Only, only SMA I, I use is for the 200. I use the 200 SMA. 100-day, um, I might use the SMA. Eh. Uh, what I do is I'll bring up the 100-day or 150-day just to kind of see if the stock is behaving in certain ways around those moving averages. And then I'll play with it, either it's an EMA or an SMA. But when it comes to like a 13-day, that's definitely an EMA. Uh, for the weekly chart that I showed you, the 1743 weeklies, those are definitely EMAs. Okay. All right. And then for the recordings, um, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I'm not quite sure how long it takes. I'm using GoToWebinar as this platform, uh, and I'm not, I think it takes several hours to get the recordings. Um, you're probably not going to get an email from us until tomorrow on that, so I hope that can work for you. Apologize for the delay. All right, I think that is it. So thank you very much for joining us for this, and I hope that um, you got some value out of it. Okay, have a great day, and I'll see you next time.